Great. I'd like to welcome everybody to uh, this edition of the RBR webinar series. My name is Daniel Nelson. I am a technical sales manager based in the Seattle, Washington area in the United States. Our guest presenter today is Camila Tonyakini from the University of Hawaii. Um, and I'd like to introduce her at the beginning and then we will go through the presentation. So Camila, hello and welcome. Hello, thank you. Great, so we usually start these webinars with uh, a few questions, a bit of an interview with our guest presenter, so we can get to know who you are and your motivations for doing this uh, important work. So could you tell us a bit about your background and how you ended up in, in oceanography? So, um, hi everyone. I am uh, originally from Italy and um, I traveled to Hawaii to pursue studies in oceanography. Um, I got a degree in global environmental sciences in my undergraduate from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. And for a few years, I worked as a biogeochemist. And then I decided I needed to learn more about um, physics and ocean waves. And so I switched and I joined graduate school as a physical oceanography graduate student. Oh, fantastic. Um, and on this particular project, which we're talking about waves and wave energy <laughs> and model validation, what has been your specific role and how have you been involved uh, in, in this work? So we have a pretty big team, which is really cool to work with. And my part is mainly working with the instrumentation and collecting the data. Um, so that's uh, my thing and it's the part I enjoy the most. Right, and, I, and you do the scuba diving, right? And you install the loggers and pull them up and everything. No, so I'm not a diver, um, but I've been helping with the deployments. Oh, gotcha. Sounds good. Um, and then what's one um, fun and interesting fact uh, that you can tell us that maybe your lab mates don't don't know or people on the call certainly don't know. What would be something that we could learn about you? Uh, well, I guess it's related to my research and um, yeah, I'm not a scientific diver, but in trying to install all these RBRs in the near shore, I had to learn how to free dive and it is now like my favorite hobby. I love free diving. So it's a bit related to the research, but it's now taken a big part in my life. And how deep can you go free diving? I've gone to about over 30 feet, but I'm going to try and go a bit deeper. Wow. That's yeah. Fantastic. I couldn't imagine. So that sounds great. Thanks for joining us. And we'll begin the presentation now. Um, the, the, the format of the talk is going to go like this. I'm going to speak for about 10 minutes uh, on the RBR instruments that you've used in your research. Um, talk a bit about the features and the functionality of those instruments. Then I'm going to switch uh, we'll switch screens and you'll take over and do the science presentation for about 20-25 minutes and then we'll open up our cameras and have a, a bit of an di informal discussion with the guests um, to, to answer any questions and, and continue the conversation. So that's the plan for today and I'm just going to get started now. We, um, the topic of this talk is about the RBR Solo D which is one of our compact loggers and RBR is an instrumentation company. We, man we manufacture oceanographic grade, best in class uh, sensors and instruments for measuring what we call the blue planet, which is the marine environment, the coastal environment, rivers. Um, and we, we, we do that in a variety of ways. So first of all, we make sensors. So pictured here is the, our optical dissolved oxygen sensor, uh, but we also make a, a, a variety of serial sensors uh, that connect to other uh, data logging systems or autonomous vehicles, uh, and so they're quite flexible that way. Uh, we make loggers. Uh, pictured here is our RBR Concerto CTD, and a logger is, is simply a collection of sensors that is integrated to a, a CPU board, a computer platform with memory uh, and battery power, and they work autonomously so that you can collect a variety of measurements uh, in a single platform. Systems. These are ways that RBR can help you collect your data uh, from bring it up from the bottom of the sea to the surface and from the surface via telemetry to your workstation or servers. And so we make a, uh, inductive modem systems and also uh, a marine buoy telemetry system called the RBR Cervello, which can connect your oceanographic data um, by either uh, GSM satellite or satellite uh, telemetry to your servers. Our OEM, team works really hard to repackage our sensor technology that includes our conductivity, temperature, depth, dissolved oxygen, 
and other sensors uh, into different form factors that are used by float manufacturers and autonomous underwater uh, vehicle manufacturers. And so pictured here is uh, the RBR Argo uh, system, which is basically our RBR CTD that's packaged for Argo floats. And from these four core uh, pillars of RBR's technology, you can see here we have a variety of instruments um, that are available to oceanographic researchers and, and coastal engineers. Um, we have our CTDs over on the right-hand side um, in various forms with, with different sensors integrated. Down at the bottom, we have our high-precision uh, digicorts pressure loggers and wave loggers um, that are capable of doing shallow deployments. Uh, or very, very deep deployments up to 6,000 meters. Over on the left in the upper corner, uh, we have the RBR Cervello, which I mentioned, which is our marine telemetry unit that's used um, typically on the wire walker platform, um, which is down below on the lower left of the screen. So it's a free uh, wave generated profiling uh, float that then the uh, water quality data from the RBR system is then uh, transmitted remotely to servers via the RBR Cervello. So that's one of our systems. Today's talk is gonna be about a compact logger, which are the yellow loggers up on the top of the screen. And um, I'll just get right to it. So um, the instrument used in Camila and her team's research is the RBR Solo D, which is one of our most uh, common, our most popular instruments. It's one of the most flexible instruments as well, uh, capable of being deployed in a variety of environments. Um, it is a, pressure sensor, um, and that's at the very the red tip here uh, of the instrument has carries the pressure sensor. It's got a metal diaphragm, and then inside there is a silicon pressure transducer um, that, then, um, in, that then sends the, the information to the data logger on the inside. There's a single AA battery, and this particular uh, instrument in yellow uh, is our shallower water uh, plastic housing instrument. That's our standard RBR Solo D. You can um, purchase RBR Solo Ds uh, in a variety of pressure ratings, uh, starting at 20 D-bar uh, up to 1,000 D-bar for the plastic sensors. Um, and then we have titanium uh, loggers that are uh, able to be deployed in up to 10,000 uh, meters of water. The accuracy of the RBR Solo D is 0.05% of full scale. So that means if you have a 20 D-bar pressure rated sensor, you can then uh, have an accuracy of one centimeter. And they're extremely low powered uh, and instruments so that you can deploy with one hertz sampling for over a year. And so we have some numbers on the screen there of how different deployments and the numbers of samples that you can get from the RBR Solo D. It comes, the instrument comes in a variety of, of types. Uh, including sample rate. So you can get fast sampling uh, solo Ds up to 32 hertz. You can also get instruments that provide a bit of additional support for tide measurements and wave measurements. So the RBR Tide 16 enables you to do fast sampling continuously, but then also to do burst sampling and tidal averaging um, to get the tidal slope. Or you can have the RBR Solo D Wave 16 logger which then provides the data file necessary to perform uh, wave statistics and wave analysis and, and to figure out significant wave height and wave period and those kinds of things. So all of these options are available with the Solo D. Um, we also have titanium versions of the sensor that can go to 10,000 meters. It looks like this. And we also have a combined duet TD, which means temperature depth. It's a two channel logger in the same form factor as the Solo D, but then you can, um, you have a marine grade temperature sensor either with a one second or a 100 millisecond time constant. So you can get both temperature and depth uh, at the same time. If we were to undo one of the housings of the RBR Solo D, it would start looking like this. You would have the, battery which comes with the system. It's a 3.6 volt lithium battery that comes with it. And then you'd have a desiccant trap in the middle. And then you would have the USB-C connector 
that will enable you to configure your logger and download your data. And configuring the RBR Solo D is done in Ruskin software, which is our software application. So um, RBR has one software platform for all of our instruments uh, and it's called Ruskin. And basically if you plug in your RBR Solo D to your computer uh, and have Ruskin uh, turned on, the software automatically identifies your logger and you're able to set up the configuration of your logger in a matter of, well, a few seconds or minutes. Um, and you can either choose a calendar start, a date and a time based on your local time on your computer or UTC time. Um, you can enable it to start logging immediately and then you can change the continue, uh, the, the sampling rates. And you can also determine, you can sort of project plan your deployment and determine how long your battery is gonna last or how much memory you're gonna have for your deployment. So there's many useful features within Ruskin software uh, to help uh, your deployments. If you find you need a little extra power or a little longer deployment, um, or you wanna take uh, faster samples and get more samples for longer, then you can always get our standard logger, which is the RBR Virtuoso D, or a duo with TD, temperature depth. Um, and that has eight AA batteries. It lets you get many, many more readings because you can sample for faster for longer. And then you also have the opportunity to have the data um, communication options available on our standard loggers, such as Wi-Fi or cabled outputs, uh, power inputs, those kinds of things. So you don't need to be stuck with the compact logger if you think your deployment requires some, uh, some more battery power and more longevity. And the final thing I wanna share is just a, a, a bit of a tip, um, especially for those that use uh, multiple instruments that have large uh, amounts of instruments that they're deploying and they want to save themselves some time or have added convenience while uh, configuring their loggers and that's our auto features that are within Ruskin software. So there's three different auto features that you can select and, and attach to your instrument. Um, one of them is auto download. So that what that means is that when you plug in the USB cable to your RBR Solo D, it automatically downloads the, the data file in the format and to the prescribed directory that you've chosen previously. So that means you're not clicking through a bunch of different windows to try and figure out where you want to stick your RSK file. It's already been determined and it does it automatically when you put in the USB cable. The next auto feature is auto stop. Uh, and that basically stops the, the logging from happening once you plug in the USB cable. Um, it doesn't do anything more than that. So typically we ask you that, that you, you couple that with an auto download so that then you stop deployment and then download your file automatically. So you can tick, tick both auto stop and auto download. And the final auto function um, that if you're trying to configure a bunch of loggers for the same uh, sample rate or the same schedule and you've got a lineup of loggers that you're trying to do, you can do auto deploy, um, which basically means when you unplug and plug into a new logger, it does the um, auto stop, it downloads the file and, and puts on a new configuration uh, onto this new logger automatically. So saving you time to click around and also human error mistakes for, for doing different sample rates for the clock or things like that. So um, these are some features that are available in Ruskin. And as you can see um, over on the right-hand window where the Solo D is, is in Ruskin, there's a few icons up at the top, the arrow and those little um, gears show that auto download and auto uh, deploy have been enabled for this instrument. So we thought that would be an added uh, tip for those that are deal with a bunch of instruments at one time and wanted to save some uh, time and energy when configuring your instruments. That's it for the product discussion. I'd like to turn it over to Camila for her science discussion. I'm really excited about it. She's got some great photos. Uh, and great information about how to deploy these loggers. So um, we're really excited for your presentation, Camila, and I'm going to figure out how to transfer my screen to you or to have you start sharing. Okay. So I'm gonna stop sharing. And I think you can start. Thank you there. Do you see my screen? Yes, it's perfect. Thank you. Okay, great. Well, thank you for the introduction, Dan. And um, aloha, everybody. Um, 
I'm over here uh, working from home. I'm on the beautiful east side of Oahu. And um, the sun just came up, so you might still hear some roosters going off. But um, here in the background in the picture, that's me um, deploying one of our instruments in Napili Bay on West Maui. Inside that tube is a RBR logger, um, but I'll tell you more about that later. Um, so our project is primarily funded by a NOAA program, um, but we also um, collaborate with a lot of funding from PAC-IOS and the Sea Grant for our field work, as well as JIMAR and the University of Hawaii at Manoa. So it's not switching. There. So the motivation for our study, um, studying wave energetics in West Maui, is that um, the impacts of wave runup in West Maui are really severe. Um, West Maui has a complicated nearshore environment, which includes um, a lot of fringing reef, slope, sloping beaches, um, as well as rocky and armored shoreline. It's also a very important cultural and socioeconomic region. Um, sorry. So our objectives um, ultimately are to understand um, all these variations of the gravity wave transformations in the near shore and to ultimately provide near-term forecasts of wave-induced runup for West Maui so that the community can prepare for these events. Um, here are some impacts of wave runup in West Maui. So up there in the corner is West Maui. And um, we can see there's a lot of loss of sand, um, loss of vegetation, um, it, severe impacts to the coastline. There is structural damage to properties along the coastline, as well as there's regular overtopping of the only road in and out of West Maui, which is a serious safety issue. So you might be wondering, well, what is wave runup? And here on the right, um, you see this arrow is pointing to the runup height on the beach. And so runup is the maximum height the water reaches at the shore. And there are many components that influence wave runup. So let me guide you through this slide. So we have the long period variability, which is the background sea level, and it's influenced by large scale motions um, of long period um, multi-day open ocean currents and things like that, as well as the variability of the tides. You may have heard of the king tides. Those are just the highest astronomical tides of the year. And then we have the swell-driven phenomena. And these are um, the phenomena that arise after wave breaking. So when the swell breaks over shallow bathymetry, there's all this energy transfer uh, to longer period infragravity waves, as well as shorter period swash, which accumulates at the shore. These are the bores, the white water that you see. Um, there is also, um, the swell also causes setup, which is the time average water elevation at the shore. So the combination of these components, the background sea level and the wave driven components all contribute to the water level at the shore. So let's see. So here I will be showing you what infragravity waves look like because it's hard to imagine those. So here's a video. And this is the North Shore of Oahu. And here, what you can see is all this white water. These are the, what we call the swash. These are the swell waves that are reaching the shore. And what you will see is these surging waves that elevate the sea level at minute 220 and 730. I'll point them out to you. And those are the infragravity surges. So let's play the video. And you will see pretty soon at minute two, there, there was a surge. And then wait for it again. At 7.30, the water level will come up again and flood the coastline. Pretty soon, there it is, right there. So this, I can play this again. This is what the infragravity surge looks like. The other waves right on top of it, and so when the infragravity surge comes on periods of, you know, a few minutes to hours, it, it elevates all of the sea level. And the, the short period of bores ride on top of that sea level and flood the coastline. So hopefully that makes it clearer. But let's look at our study site um, here in Hawaii. West Maui is located in between the Maui Island group, between Molokai and Lanai. 
And the shallow bathymetry between the island group causes um, a lot of refraction and focusing east to west Maui. We have incoming swells from the, these narrow inter-island channels from the north, the west, and the south. And so this combination of bathymetry also allows for long period resonant coastal modes. So to understand and better prepare for these wave runoff events, um, forecasts are necessary. And so due to the complex bathymetry, which varies a lot near along shore, um, we need uh, two-dimensional modeling. So we've chose the Pusinesque Ocean and Surf Zone model, which is a two-dimensional, fully nonlinear and weakly dispersive. It's phase resolving and it's a numerical wave model. Um, it's really cool because it resolves along shore and across shore wave dynamics and it simulates wave runup. So what this means is we can simulate these infragravity waves and all these pro the swash and infragravity and all these processes that contribute to the runup. Um, so, so the forecast, the progression of forecasts um, is quite long. We start with a global wind forecast, uh, which forces a global wave watch three, which forces a smaller wave watch three with a Hawaii, just a Hawaii grid, which forces an even smaller, I mean, larger resolution Maui swan. And that forces a West Maui high resolution model which forces our phase resolving West Maui boss. Here on the right, you can see the boss setup with two domains. We have picked um, these 42 virtual gauges, which are the, where we, the wave maker input for the model. And this model will be running and providing these live forecasts for the West Maui community. And I will show you that later. But here we're gonna look at some of our modeling. So these are some preliminary simulations from BOS on a large single domain, which we use to guide our field program. So you can see um, that these are significant wave heights for a south and a north swell. And these are the typical swell directions for um, summer and winter. And you can see that in both cases, there is a lot of refraction and focusing of swell energy into the entire West Maui domain for both swell directions. Uh, for example, if you look at this south swell image, you can see this finger of energy reaching the north of West Maui, that's Napili Bay. And we've observed this finger of energy from the south shore from webcams, and that's really cool that the model is capturing that. What we can also do with the model is look at the spatial distribution of infragravity energy. So this is um, energy plotted, spectral energy density. And on the left, we have just periods between half a minute and one minute. While on the right, we have periods between two to four minutes. So in both period bands, there is a lot of spatial variability. But let's look at the shorter period first on the left. Um, you see that the energy varies distinctly along shore. And here in this Kahana area, we can see that there is a periodic pattern um, and this indicates resonant infragravity waves. Well, if we look at the longer periods, we can see that these are larger scale motions. What is cool in both plots is that you can see that the maximum energy is located near the coastline, and that is the structure of the infragravity wave. So <clears throat> we will be validating the model observation the model with observations. So that's why we needed an array of observations to capture the along and across shore dynamics to validate our model. So here is a map of West Maui with our instrumented field program. We are, have currently instruments deployed along the entire coast of West Maui. We have um, these RBR Solo D pressure sensors at shallow depths of two to three meters as well as two arrays. And uh, we have pressure sensors in the array, um, as well as a, a current meter and an acoustic wave and current profiler in the offshore, the most off offshore location. Um, so this Kahana array up on the top, uh, we've already collected some data from there. And the rest of our instruments are currently deployed. And unfortunately, we were trying to 
go and recover them on Maui uh, this week, actually, but uh, we're still stuck at home, so the instruments have to wait, unfortunately. But I'm going to show you some of our deployments. Um, it was very easy to deploy these RBR solo Ds, um, and we're working on Maui, so we don't have a lab there, so it's really challenging to prepare stuff, and it was really easy to program the instruments. Here is a picture of us, and we have the RBR plugged into the computer, and we're turning around, we're downloading data, and redeploying the instrument. And this was only possible because everything is so easy and straightforward, and we're able to do it in an SUV. And then here on the right, we're in the middle, we're preparing instrument packages at the park, and I'll show you more about our instrument packages in a minute. And then we used a, a research vessel for deeper sites with help of scuba divers, but for shallower near shore sites, uh, we had to be creative and we used surfboards, kayaks, and snorkel. So I'm gonna show you, okay, here are our UH divers deploying one of our RBRs in the sand. But I'm going to show you what our instrument package looks like. This is our sand deployment. And of course, um, in other places, uh, people are allowed, like on remote islands, are allowed to bolt their instruments to the reef, but we can't touch the reef here in Hawaii, so we have to be very careful. So we've had to deploy in sand, which is challenging because sand moves, so you want to check your instruments regularly. But here are two of our deployments. They work pretty well in some places, and we're using this sand anchor tube, which you can, it's an umbrella tube, and you can twist it into the sand, and so that's how it holds. And we've put cement in it. We modified it a lot. And then we use this fiberglass grate to hold this instrument steady. And then inside this tube, we've secured one of these RBR loggers. And we covered everything in vinyl tape because it really helps to clean the biofouling. So here in the upper picture, you can see this is a recovered RBR after six months. And it's all dirty. But as soon as you get the tape off, it's like new. So that's a really good tip we got from other researchers to use tape. This is another style of deployment for more of a reef environment. And we're being very careful not to touch any live coral. But um, here we had to modify our deployment and we're just using a PVC tube with the RBR inside. And we've secured it on a, on a fiberglass grate with a lot of zinc weights because there's a lot of energy in the near shore and these things need to stay put and we use a marker buoy to mark our location uh, we have one more style of deployment for mixed um, reef sand environments we just added an anchor to our package to secure it because you wouldn't believe how many of these things move <laughs> and so, so far we've collected data from our Kahana array from uh, the winter of 2018, 2019. So here I'm showing some uh, RBR pressure data, which I've converted to sea level uh, via linear wave theory. And uh, we used continuous sampling at two Hertz um, because we want to see all the wave phenomena, even the longer periods, we're interested in everything. And we've switched to one hertz now because it lasts a lot longer for us. So this is one week of data from a two meter depth site. And we've removed um, the low pass signal to remove the tidal signal. But as you can see, it's really cool because the, um, the near shore sea level is modulated by the tide. So the tide basically uh, dictates how much energy comes into the near shore. And so we're gonna look at, this is one week of data. We're gonna zoom in to two hours of data. And here in the orange, we've plotted the low pass to show the variation of the infragravity energy. And then if we zoom in to 12 minutes, that will be very clear. Well, you see in the cyan, all these squiggles are the, the gravity wave bores that are reaching to the shore and they're riding on top of this longer period infragravity wave surge. So it's really cool that we're able to see that in our data. So now I'm gonna show you some more data. Um, so these are significant wave heights. Um, so let's look at the map in the black. 
we have um, a sensor at 12 meters depth, and these are once again all pressure sensors. Um, and the blue sensor is in the braking zone at three meters, and the red sensor is at um, two meters depth. And so um, these are observations from a really energetic north swell event in November 2018. And so in the top panel, you see the long period sea level. This is um, you know, basically the tides. In the middle panel, you see the swell band, the swell significant height, wave heights from periods of five seconds to 30 seconds. And you can see that the two most offshore locations in the black and in the blue have high wave energy, while the red has very little swell, swell energy. And as you can see, you can see that tidal modulation in the near shore, um, as we saw in the previous plot. Um, down here, in the near infragravity significant wave heights in periods from 30 seconds to five minutes, we can see that most of the energy is in the braking zone at the blue sensor, while the near shore still has this tidal modulation. It's interesting that the offshore location sees no more and sees no energy in this band. Uh, while in the far infragravity of periods of five minutes to 90 minutes, we see that the energy is elevated at the near shore, which is what we would expect. Um, now we're going to look at a portion of these data right here uh, from the previous plot when the swell most en was most energetic and we're going to look at the frequency space at the spectral dense energy density. So this is spectra from the offshore gauge and the sea level here has the maximum energy in the swell band. Now if we overlay the next spectra from the next site, this is really interesting because um, the blue sensor is in the braking zone and the spectra here shows these signatures of nonlinear energy transfer. As you can see, the swell energy has diminished at the blue sensor and we have nonlinear energy transfer to higher frequencies as well as to lower frequency motions in the near IG and the far IG. And so this is classic nonlinear energy transfer. Now, if we overlay the near shore spectra, it's really cool because all the swell energy is gone and we have the far infragravity energy is elevated. Um, it's really interesting. There's this peak at one hour and this is present in all of our records and this is a large scale motion and this is um, Basically, we think it's this known low amplitude large scale oscillation that's been seen before in historical, historical tide gauge data, and as well as in tsunami modeling studies. Now we're going to look at some of our model data. We're going to look at the coherence between different sites. So let's look at the map first. If we look at these two sites in the across shore, marked in the yellow, they are two hundred meters apart and while the two alongshore sites marked with pink are 300 meters apart and they're in shallow water. Now I plotted the coherence, the data is plotted, the observations are plotted in black and the modeled simulation is plotted in cyan. So let's look at the top panel. I'd like you to know here that in the two to three minute infragravity period there is high amplitude coherence and there's constant phase here. And same thing um, around one minute, and there's a phase jump in the middle. So this hints to inf um, across shore infragravity structures. If we look at the bottom panel, we also see um, this constant, um, this high amplitude and constant phase with a phase jump. And then um, if we look at the, at the swell band, we see, um, phase wrapping, which is indicative of propagation. So uh, what is really cool about these um, plots, these coherences, is that there is remarkable agreement between the observations and the model. And so we're very excited. And so basically we're validating the model in this Kahana area with our data. 
And here is just to bring it back to the model. These are some model simulations and it's um, spectral energy density on the left panel in the five second to 17 minute band. And it includes um, the infragravity and the swash, which are plotted on the right. The green is the swash and infragravity is the orange. And you can see these two components have run up very significantly along shore and West Maui. And here in Kahana, we see very elevated infragravity energy from these model results, and that's exactly what we were able to observe. So now that we are starting to really trust our numerical model, we're applying it for these live forecasts. So I'm going to show you. Um, so we have these uh, wave runoff forecasts are currently being um, tested in a beta, beta version. And so because of the variability along West Maui, we've separated the, the forecast into 12 different domains because each region has different um, morphology and different, it's impacted differently by different swell directions. So this is the, will be the main page of our forecast, which will be coming soon on the PAC IOS website. And as you mouse over each region, you will get a forecast for that region. So there's all kinds of information on the tabs about you know, how to read these forecasts, but this is one of, an example of the forecast for today. And we can see that we are expecting some high sea level this afternoon in Ukumehame, Maui. And here this plot, the solid line is the tides and the dotted line is the tide plus the runoff components. So this is our forecast and these thresholds on the side, the A and the B, is a really critical feature of our forecast. And we've been setting these thresholds based on the um, photos that we're receiving from our citizen scientists. So basically, we've calibrated our forecast uh, by collecting examples of run-up photos, uh, where there's photos where there's impacts on West Maui, and looking at the forecast and assigning an impact to an impact level to our forecast. So this is an ongoing work. We are very thankful to our citizen scientists for all the pictures they're submitting. And so together with the pictures and with the pressure data, we're able to calibrate and fine tune our forecast so that it, it's meaningful to the people on Maui who need to use it. Um, and this sort of forecast, this is a, these are six day forecasts and they will be helping the West Maui community and the community managers to prepare and recover from uh, wave run up events. So I'd really like to thank all of our collaborators. This is a huge um, team effort. We have um, our West Maui Coastal Resilience Team that's working on, I really wanna thank my colleagues, um, Volker and Asaf for the modeling and Martin for all the forecast work he's been doing, as well as all the work, the help we've gotten in the field on West Maui from our citizen scientists from the community. And as well, um, I wanna thank the funding agencies and I'll leave it open for some questions. Thank you. Thanks, Camila. Hi. That was excellent. We really appreciate that presentation. I just love seeing all the photos and we're glad that the, uh, the roosters could join us for the talk. So yeah. that was excellent. You're actually really in Hawaii, which is fantastic. So um, yeah. um, I have a few questions, but I do want to open it up to the, uh, to the group to see if anybody, I don't know if anybody's posted in the chat yet. No, not yet. Does anybody uh, that has participated have any questions or else I will ask mine uh, that I have? Please don't be shy. You're welcome to unmute and you don't have to show your face. Just uh, ask a question if you have them. Okay, well, I'll kick things off then. Um, so Camila, could you tell us a bit about when you have a model and you're trying to validate it with instrumentation, what criteria do you use to determine how many instruments you need or what the setup is or where they go, where they're deployed in order to better uh, validate your model? 
So <clears throat> it's a good question. I think we're still working on exactly what model validation looks like. So far, what we really did, which was cool, is we used the initial model simulation that I showed at the beginning to choose our instrument uh, deployment locations. And that was really good because that way we were able to place our instruments where we could capture those infragravity structures. And so that worked out very well as far as um, picking deployment locations. Of course, it was very hard in the field to deploy things in straight lines, and that didn't always work out, especially with our first deployments, but we're getting better at that. And uh, that's because we're looking for sand pockets to deploy in, and sometimes there are none. Mm. And the other thing is we are just really uh, looking at what the time series look like and what the spectra look like with the energy um, for the model. And we've tried a few different grid sizes and different settings with the model, such as using, well, we're using this two domain setup, but we've tried five domains. We've tried um, having you know, lateral wave makers, and I don't know too much about the modeling, but we've tried different things and we finally found a um, thing that runs in the time we have because it's very uh, computationally expensive and we're running it live. Mm -hmm. So a compromise of uh, resolution and um, time and it's working pretty well for us so far. Excellent. Well, thank you. We have a couple questions that have come in. Um, is there a concern with putting these loggers in tubes that will affect the pressure signal? No, like actually, why, are they, why are they put in tubes and what's the impact? So they're put in tubes because they're so tiny that we need to secure them to something. And um, putting it in a tube had um, no impact on our measurement. We actually, we've, there's a lot of sedimentation in some of these areas and we've recovered instruments that were just covered in gunk. I mean, like even, you know, the top of the pressure sensor was covered in such fine silt, the instrument was stained, but the pressure signal was perfect. I mean, there was no, no signal attenuation. We even had an instrument half buried under the sand once it toppled over. Mm. And, you know, once we saw it moved, it kept recording perfectly, even though it was lopsided. So I think it, it protects the instrument to put in the tubes and it prevents from losing these and um, just need a lot of weight um, around them. But no, no problems with the signal from being in the tube. Great. Um, we have another question. It's um, specifically about models. Um, and I'll, I'll say it orally, but maybe it might be an opportunity for a direct contact as well. Um, it says, nice talk. Um, do you... Uh, how do you integrate the wave attenuation crossing the reef platforms in your model? It'd be great to know a bit more about the details of your run-up model. So That's a great question. I don't personally run the model. I just use the data that I'm given from my coworkers. So I would have to refer that question to my modelers because I really don't know. Sorry. Okay. Well, thanks, Zhang Wei, for the question. We will uh, try and get in touch uh, and get an answer yeah. to you. We appreciate we that. Can get back to you. Um, I'm looking, okay, so then that, that's more about the plastic tube. Um, I have another question. So you mentioned that in terms of the RBR loggers, you used the two hertz continuous sampling. Uh, and how long a deployment were you able to get out of those? About 60 days. Okay. Um, and then once you had that two hertz continuous data, how was it processed? Because um, you obviously just took the continuous data to do your wave analysis to use a particular program, or how did the sort of data export and processing um, activities happen? So what we did is we just, uh, I downloaded the text file from the Ruskin software, and I just used the pressure data, and we do all our own calculations on Python. Um, so, we do our sea level conversion and everything. We work in Python. Okay. No, that's really common. Awesome. Do you have any other tips uh, in terms of the deployment? You mentioned about the tape, the tubes, the finding the sandy bottoms. Was there anything other uh, recommendations that you might have for users of, of RBR instruments or other uh, absolute pressure sensors for wave measurement? Um, well, it took us uh, quite a few tries before refining our instrument packages. Um, a few things went wrong and we lost some things and um, it's quite, it's very challenging to deploy in the near shore. A few of our sensors were found by people 
on the beach and were returned to us because you know, one meter deployments are really hard to keep still. So it would be ideal to have a fix, something fixed to deploy on. We're actually looking for things in the ocean, such as we found a huge chain and we've uh, strapped our instruments to that. Um, deploying in the sand is not ideal and it's really hard. You, you would want to check them very often and that's what we're, the challenge we're facing right now is that we're on a different island and we can't be on Maui right now to uh, recover our instruments. But other than that, it's so easy to deploy. Um, you just need weight for things to not move. That's my main tip is use a lot of weight. Oh, that sounds good. Um, I think we're going to uh, end there. A question. Oh, we have oh, oh, I have one more question. Sorry, it's Candace. Hi. 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 Um, I was just wondering if uh, it's more of a sort of larger scale question. Do you have uh, any idea of like how much of the coast in Hawaii or um, in particular like on that island that is sort of threatened by the infogravity surges? So yes, that coast on West Maui is particularly uh, affected. Um, and I'm not sure why, but we have a lot of problems basically on all, all coastlines with chronic erosion, especially where there's infrastructure close to the road, um, close to the beach, especially all the roads. And there's a lot of hotels built there too. So we're seeing the same things all over the Hawaiian Islands in Oahu, um, the North Shore, Waikiki. But West Maui is getting uh, hit really hard. And the strange thing is it doesn't get large swells. Um, because it seems sheltered, but all of these other wave components, the infragravity and, and all these other um, modes between the island group are what are causing the sea level to elevate. So it's a really interesting example of run up. Um, but why this is happening is uh, just a slow rise of sea level. And unfortunately, we need to prepare because the reefs are getting really damaged from all the erosion of the coastline. Great, thank you, thank you. That was a really great talk, I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Well, thanks Camila, we really enjoyed having you join uh, RBR today for our webinar. So thanks again for your time. Um, and we, we appreciate your talk and we respect your science. And so we're really glad to have you, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm gonna stop recording now.